Good morning, IADSA members, and welcome to our June Boardroom Bites at Nine. I see many of you have already joined. Good morning, Erica, John, Heidi, Laratu, Kubus, Roger, Walter, Lily. Good morning, everybody. I am Johandi Slavert, and I will be your host this morning. Before I welcome Elise LaRue, our speaker this morning, let's quickly go through the functionalities of the webinar. As you know, please post any of your questions in the Q&A box. You can do so during the session and we will address the questions at the end of the talk in the dedicated Q&A time slot. And you can post any comments or general links in the chat box. At today's session, I would like to welcome Elise LaRue from the Institute for Security Studies on her topic, From Risk to Resilience, How Do We Get There? Good morning, Elise. Elise is a senior researcher at the Institute for Security Studies and brings a wealth of experience in disaster risk reduction and climate change ad adaptation. Before joining the ISS, she worked as a principal researcher at the CSIR, supporting long-term planning decisions. She is currently serving on the board of directors for the Climate Disaster and Resilience Fund. The topic this morning um, will focus on the risk that climate change poses in South African settlements and its inhabitants, such as flooding, fire, droughts, and heat waves. Um, she will also look at how we can build resilience around these um, risks for communities. And then finally, look at the larger development trends that's unfolding in Southern Africa. A warm welcome, Elise, and I will then join you a little bit later. Thank you, Johandi, and, and good morning. And thank you for the opportunity to present here today. As mentioned by Johandi, I work for the Institute for Security Studies. Uh, we are, a, just a little bit of background, we are a nonprofit organization. We've got offices across Africa, Pretoria, where I'm situated, Dakar, Nairobi, others. And the work of the Institute really covers multiple aspects from uh, transnational crimes, crimes prevention, migration, maritime security, development, peacekeeping, peace building, criminal justice, and so forth. And then the group that I work for is called the African Futures and Innovation Program. And we are concerned with um, undertaking long-term country thematic studies throughout Africa. And we explore how important development trends are unfolding across time by an analyzing variables like agriculture, education, economics, energy, the environment, governance, and we'll delve into some of that today. And we, our aim is really to provide decision makers with forward-thinking policy analysis to really plan key development pathways. So I'm going to share my screen and then we'll get started. So around, roughly around, just making sure everything, okay. Uh, just one second. Um, maybe you, Andy, just to confirm that you can indeed see my screen. That is correct. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so roughly around um, a year ago, we launched the African Futures and Innovation website. So that's what I'm displaying on the screen, um, which is an open access. It's a freely available resource. A res um, resource. It's actually a platform or a portal that provides forecasting information for each of Africa's 54 member states. So many of the longer term development trends, um, things like population growth, poverty, inequality, urbanization, Many of these trends that I'll also speak to today is extracted from this website. Um, and this is also an open invitation, so please feel free after the presentation to explore it a bit and to also get into contact with us. And we'll be happy to take you through either a specific country of your interest in Africa or then a specific topic of your interest. But to kick us off, um, I've listed what we or what I consider to be the 15 biggest development risks in the Southern Africa development community. So this is so short for SADC. Um, so I choose SADC, which is the Southern Africa region where South Africa has got a vital role to play in to frame the discussion today. So it's a bit of a more regional perspective, but it helps us to understand the development trends and patterns in South Africa and that of our neighbors and how that of our neighbors influence South Africa as well. 
So especially when we speak about things like migration, political instability, food security, it is important to have a little bit of a, a, a larger regional perspective when we talk about these trends and development patterns. So I've listed these 15 here on the screen, um, but they are no specific order of, 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 of risk, but just to mention things like political instability, we know that the SADC region, since its formation in 1980, has seen a lot of um, turbulence. Um, it's maybe a bit more stable than the rest of Africa, but also it's not been spared from things like armed conflicts, civil wars, uh, political transitions, governance changes, frequent leadership changes. We can just think of the current jihadist insurgency in the north of Mozambique, uh, the endemic conflicts in the east of DRC, and these all have um, profound impact on the region. Uh, we can think about the economic vulnerability of the region, high unemployment rates, slow economic growth, specifically in South Africa, high levels of poverty and inequality, um, the Southern Africa region being some of the highest in the globe, growing in, uh, food insecurity, which is a trend that we're picking up, um, a region that is marked by water insecurity, frequent droughts, and also high levels of illicit trade, human and drug trafficking, um, and a lot of internally displaced people and migration and refugees. So I can continue with this list, um, and I think we can have a seminar series of each one of these topics. But the one that I want to spend a little bit of time on today um, is this one that I've, I've highlighted in red, and this is the risk of natural disasters and climate change to development. So what do we mean when we talk about a disaster, a climate disaster? And in this case, um, we sometimes refer to them as hydrometeorological disasters because they're driven by the climate, they include hydrological disasters, they include meteorological disasters. So we classify a disaster as an extreme phenomena um, that has taken place at a very specific location that's caused large-scale devastation. Um, it's detrimental to infrastructure, they cause loss of lives, uh, they disrupt communities' livelihoods or ability to earn a livelihood. And they also force people to either relocate and they are normally, it's required to bring in external assistance into such a situation to establish more a normality again. So we can think of just, I mean, last year's flooding in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, this was a disaster that cost nearly 500 people's lives. Uh, the Nisner fires in 2017 that caused infrastructure damage in excess of 3 billion rand. So these are all disasters that, cause severe loss of life. They disrupt livelihoods within the communities and in the wider region. They displace a significant amount of people and they have um, very significant economic impacts. So these disasters, why do these disasters happen? They are a very complex interplay between the physical and the human system. So it is when there is an interaction between a hazard, an exposed element, and when the capacity of that exposed element is unable to withstand that specific threat, and then it fails. So we know that physical systems, they do pose a threat to humans, but they only have an impact if something or someone is exposed to them. And when that something or someone was vulnerable and unable to withstand the onslaught of that hazard. So I mentioned these three elements, and you can see them in the graph. It is the hazard we are faced with, um, the exposure to it, and then the vulnerability, of the, of the vulnerability of the exposed element, because it is these three very specific elements that drive losses and associated costs. But it's also these three elements where we can intervene in and ensure that we see less um, loss of lives and loss of livelihoods. So the direct costs of disasters, um, these are normally the results of an interplay. Like I said, when we talk about natural hazards, they are driven by things like extreme weather events, rainfall variability. Um, in South Africa, we, can, we see a lot of droughts, we see a lot of flooding, we see storm systems like um, convective storms. When we talk about the region, we see a lot of cyclones, specifically in Mozambique, um, that also spills over a little bit in, inland. Uh, when we talk about um, vulnerability, this is something that's inherent within the community or the assets that's exposed. This is, and, and specifically in this region, driven by things like slow poverty reduction, the high inequality, lack of insurance in the region, poor economic growth and unemployment. 
And then when we talk about exposure, this is also something that is driven by things like land use planning, um, the inability to accommodate large influxes into cities, uh, urbanization that is not well planned for, people locating on unsafe spaces, people locating within riverbeds or in indicative flat lines. Um, and when all of these three elements come together, this is the risk formula we then normally use. Okay, so I'm just going to unpack some of these. So the first bubble in those three elements that I want to talk about is the high exposure, the high vulnerability, and the frequency. Um, that's actually yeah, the frequency of these natural hazards. So just to talk about the vulnerability and the exposure of people uh, within the region and also then zooming a little bit into South Africa. Um, we know, and I've mentioned this, but the Southern Africa region has got the highest inequalities uh, in the globe. So this graph that I'm showing here on the right-hand side, you can see this is the Gini index. You can see that Southern Africa by far has got the highest inequality regions. So this means that where there is wealth within the region, it is very unequally distributed. We can also look at things like other factors that drive vulnerability, poverty, the slow reduction in poverty rates in the area. Um, in the static area, more than 51% of people are in absolute poverty. So this is people that live below $1.90 per person per day. So there's around 200 million of these people in the 16 static states. In South Africa specifically, when we, when we speak $1.90, which has been just comparing that to the region, we have around 18% of our population, which is around 11 million people in absolute poverty. But South Africa is an upper middle income country. So for that, we use the $5.50 benchmark. And if we use that, there's about 50% of South Africa that's below the poverty line. So this is around 30 million people. And this just to put this in context with what we're seeing in the rest of the world when we exclude the African continent, poverty is around 4.3% in the globe. So this is excluding Africa, and there's around 285 million people in absolute um, poverty. So we can see an extremely large amount of poverty within the region, within South Africa, and this is driving the high vulnerability rates um, within, within the region. Also, when we talk about exposure, so that, that um, bottom part of the bubble diagram, there's a lot of exposure to natural hazards within the region. If we just focus on, on two cities, just figures that I've extracted from the CSR's Green Book, within the city of Tswane, um, there's around currently around 35,000 dwellings in the indicative flatline meaning that 35,000 buildings are built in the floodline in Tswane. So this is direct exposure, irrespective of how vulnerable these communities are, if they have insurance or if they don't have insurance, whether they're poor or whatever their socioeconomic status is, there's 35,000 dwellings exposed to flooding. If we look at Etiquini, a slightly different measure, but if we look at the high-risk flooding area, so areas that's very susceptible to flooding, there's around 75,000 people within those re, um, high-risk regions and around 23,000 buildings that is also exposed or, or that's likely um, to see a repeated events of flooding. Also, I think what drives a very high exposure within the region is also the very high levels of informality. Um, I've just added a little bit of a table here and just to show that in South Africa, around 24% of people living in urban spaces lives in informal settlements. So that's roughly around nine and a half million people. Um, you can also see that while the um, informality rate in South Africa is low in comparison to the region, I mean, the region sees figures such as 67% informality in urban areas in Madagascar, um, almost 80% in the, the DRC, 70% in Comores, 55% um, in Mozambique. It's low, but it's still an enormous amount of people. Um, that is being that's that's vulnerable and that's being exposed to these natural hazards. Okay, so if we just look at disasters and just a little bit of a record of what we've seen globally, um, in this is just a global figure of disasters. So there's been more than we look at the last four decades. So there's been more than ten thousand climate-related disasters in the globe for the last four decades. Um, this impacts around three hundred and sixty million people per annum, and and this figure is growing. And then I think that's what's also very clear from this graph, as you can see this uptick in recorded disasters per annum um, in this graph. Floods, so it's the blue bar in the graph that I'm showing. 
This is the most frequent disaster, and it's also responsible for displacing the mo most amount of people um, on Earth. It's also followed by storms. Um, storms are also the most costliest climate disasters um, from an infrastructure damage perspective. So this includes things like cyclones, storm surges, convective storms. Uh, when we speak about other countries, things like tornadoes and so forth, they are extremely costly and, and detrimental to infrastructure. And then droughts, uh, which is it's much less frequent. You can see that brown bar. You can see it's much less frequent than flooding or storms. Um, but they are historically, I would say prior, prior to 2000, they were the most deadliest of um, natural, natural hazards that we saw. Um, they've been since um, on par with flooding events. But prior to that, before early warning systems were well established, droughts were particularly devastating uh, when it resulted in things like famines and food insecurity. I think what is also really noteworthy um, of this data and when we analyze this data is that disasters disproportionately affect low and lower middle income countries, as they do with vulnerable communities. It's the same. So the occurrence of disasters are universal. So we see um, a lot of disasters in all of the countries. So there's no country that's, ex that's, that's exempt from, from disasters. But the record shows us that while incidences are universal, almost 70% of the recorded deaths, so people losing their lives because of a disaster, comes from low and lower middle income countries. So if you live in a low income country, like let's say Mozambique, for instance, or Madagascar, you are five times more likely to die from climate related disasters than those living in a high income country. And this for the region is also something to take note of. And this is a direct result because of a lack of resilience and again, the high levels of vulnerability within the communities. Um, and then also the just decimal investment in risk reduction within these countries. And I think for Africa as a whole, before we now zoom into South Africa and the region, 46 out of the 54 states are classified as low and low middle income countries. So Africa really, really is very, very susceptible um, to natural hazards. Okay, so just zooming in a little bit to Southern Africa. So again, these 16 SADC states, it's got a very similar picture um, in terms of disasters. So flooding, again, it remains the most frequent disaster also in this region, followed by storms and then droughts. Um, Southern Africa also has a couple of upper middle income countries, so we are seeing less deaths being recorded because of natural disasters, um, but there is an increase in economic damage in the region, and the number of people affected is still very, very high, and the number of people displaced is also significantly high. So just to talk a little bit about the spatial distribution of which countries see which types of impact, you can see from the map the economic damage in the background. Uh, the dark brown signaling high infrastructure damage and the size of a bubble showing us the number of people that is affected and that contributed to that. So in these 16 states, the SADC states, uh, we've seen around 606 disasters in the last four decades. Uh, around almost 3 million people have been left homeless and around 177 million people have been affected. Um, and the damages are upwards of, of 500 billion rand. Um, in the region. I think what's also just w worth mentioning is that when we speak about the economic damages of these disasters, it's the direct economic damage. So it's the things that they can directly account for. So it doesn't include things like um, the losses in the informal sector. It doesn't include um, the psychological damage, the health impacts, and the subsequent um, indirect damages that these disasters cause. If we zoom into South Africa and we look a little bit at the Southern Africa record of natural disasters, um, there's been around 103 um, really big disasters in um, South Africa's history over the last four decades. Again, floods, you can see it from this graph, it is the most frequent disaster. Um, around 47 really, really impactful drought, uh, floods in the region, uh, storms, followed by storms, and, and this is in the form of um, convective storms, storm surges, and then also when a cyclone does move um, southward, the impact that has on coastal regions, um, cutoff lows, which we know causes a lot of flooding events, it's recorded under the flooding um, disasters, then droughts, 
the region is exposed to a lot of um, drought events. Um, it's also quite costly, wildfires and then extreme temperatures. So just to show that um, the blue graphs here shows you the number of events. We can see uh, 11 drought events, 47 flooding events, and then this orange line shows you the costs in billion rands that these disasters have um, left the economy with suffering. Again, you can see the devastation that flooding causes, that drought causes, that storm causes. And I think one of the things that doesn't look very bad if you look at the graph is the impact of extreme temperatures. But we, we also know that in specifically in South Africa's case, um, loss of lives, loss of livelihoods, but specifically loss of lives being attributed to extreme temperatures are severely underrecorded. Um, South Africa does not have a natural um, history of disasters that is located or that's actually um, been populated in a very rigorous way. So the, the information we use is from international data sources. South Africa lacks this data database. And if it was to implement this database and if it was to really attribute extreme temperature and the deaths to those, we'll see an uptick in that. And that's also something that we expect will pick up um, in the next two or three decades. So I think what, what I've shown you globally, but also in the SADC region and South Africa, is that the Achilles heel of a region is water. It is either too much water or it's too little water. In fact, around 90% of people requiring emergency services in the region is because of either too much or too little water. So this is this graph that shows you the flooding incidences from 1990 to 2020. So this is for the SADC region. So while the increase, you can see this uptick, this, this recording uptick of natural flooding events or disasters. So it is attributed to a shift in the physical system. So the climate is shifting, that's undoubtedly true, but there's also a link to human development as well. And this is something I wanna make clear as well. So if you look at this graph, during the same time period from 1980 to 2020, thereabouts, when we see this uptick in flooding disasters, we also see significant population growth. So again, this is the SADC region, those 16 member states. So this has grown the population from 127 million people to around 350 million people during the same time period. So in this period, urbanization increased rapidly in the region. Uh, we saw the mismanagement of water catchment areas, deforestation, uh, parallel housing crisis. So again, an increase in informality within our cities. So a lot of people being forced on unsafe locations um, and cities, the way cities are being designed, how they are accommodating people. This is also directly contributing to increased stormwater runoff. And this is also increasing um, the high levels of disasters that we see. OK, so if we look a little bit ahead into the next um, two, sometimes three decades, depending on the graph I'm going to show you. Um, disaster losses will undoubtedly increase. Um, that is a trend that we're picking up. And this is because we're seeing an increase in all three of these main elements that I've spoken about. Um, climate change will continue to increase the hazards footprints, uh, the frequency of natural hazards, so how frequent we see droughts and flooding events, wildfires, extreme temperatures, the intensity thereof, and it's also going to increase the duration thereof. So we're seeing a definite increase in the hazard side of this bubble. If we look at the exposure side of this bubble, um, so the exposure of communities and infrastructure, uh, if we look at currently poorly planned developments, um, people settling again in unsafe high-risk locations, a lack of maintenance to critical infrastructure, and also the fact that municipalities are battling to accommodate increased urbanization. So this is exposing more and more people every year to these natural hazards. Um, I think if we just look at South Africa in the past two decades, um, the population has increased from, let's say the population has increased by about 32%, while informality has increased uh, roughly around 146%. So this just shows you that South Africa is not keeping pace with the growth and the cities is not, not able to accommodate the growth in a sustainable, in a sustainable manner. And also, if we look at the, the poverty, um, the vulnerability side of this, this growing bubble, uh, we know that the population will continue to grow in the region. 
Um, and we also know that urbanization, again, is placing a lot of infrastructure. And we're seeing a very, very slow poverty decline in the region. I'll get into one or two graphs. It's all contributing to this growing risk of loss of lives and loss of livelihoods because of natural disasters. Okay, so just to talk a little bit around increasing exposure, just a couple of, of trends that's taken from the African Futures Portal. Um, on the left-hand side, I've got a, a graph that shows you the population growth structured according to age groups for the SADC region. And then here in the middle, I've got the population structure for South Africa. So just to show you, in currently in around 2023, where we're at, uh, we, we're shy of 400 million people in the region in terms of a population. And this is expected to grow to over 600 million in the next two decades. So if you remember that graph I showed you with a population increase, the flooding increases, you can now look at this graph as well and see if we continue like what we're doing, more and more people will be exposed to these natural hazards. Same for South Africa, we're seeing slightly less growth in South Africa than in the Southern Africa region. Um, here the population we're estimating will grow from the current 60 million to um, around 70 million in the next two decades, 75 million by around mid-century. So I think um, this is just for urbanization rates. So South Africa, I'll show it in a second, is already much more urbanized than the rest of the region, but the region in itself is still urbanizing. So we'll see this, this point of equal urban and rural populations within the next five years or so. The region will be equally urbanized uh, or will, have, will host equal amounts of urban and rural populations. But what I want to show in this trend is this blue line that's picking up, and this is an urban population. So more and more people are moving to cities, and cities are becoming the hubs of where these people are locating. So what we are seeing is that this will become specifically the fight against natural hazards, climate change impacts, will become more of an urban problem, and it will manifest more in our urban spaces. So this is just a Southern Africa picture. You can see it's slightly or actually significantly ahead of a trend. The rest of the region, in 2023, we already had 70% of our population living in urban spaces, and this is a trend that will continue within the next um, two decades. So meaning that we'll see a lot of growth in our cities, a lot of that additional growth that I've spoken about in the static space or Southern Africa space, a lot of that growth will be absorbed in our cities and towns. And again, just to say that we already have 10 million people living in informal spaces. So this is really something that we should be careful about. If, we, if I show you just quickly a map of where this growth in South Africa will be absorbed, I think this is quite it's taken from the Green Book, but it's a nice map because it shows you where the growth pressure points within South Africa will be located. So this is a, this is a, a map that shows you the relative growth of cities and towns. So we can see the orange on the map. So these are by, by many chances our metros. They will see a lot of high growth pressure. Um, they've already grown significantly in the last two, three decades, and they will continue to absorb a lot of the people. But I think what's also important here to note, and this is the, the, the bigger cities, the secondary towns within South Africa, they will see extreme growth pressure. So the ones located on this purple color in the map, um, in this case, the population in some cases will double or triple by mid-century. Uh, if we talk about places like Emalaglene, um, we are expecting that that will grow from around just now shy of, let's say, 160,000 people will grow to around 420,000 people by mid-century. So an enormous amount of population growth in a city that's already struggling with things like sanitation, water, bulk infrastructure. Okay, and again, just to stress the point that if we don't manage and if we don't plan for this um, population growth within cities and if we don't guide informality onto safe spaces, we'll see more of the types of disasters that we saw last year in Durban. Okay, this, this brings me just to the, um, that bubble around natural hazards. What will be the impact of climate change on natural hazards within South Africa? Again, a Green Book map. Uh, we are seeing that um, this is a worst case scenario. So we call this an RCP 8.5 scenario. This is what um, by all means, everybody is trying to avoid. But under this scenario, it shows significant, significant temperature increases for the entire South Africa. 
So inland temperature increases by mid-century by as much as three degrees Celsius. Coastal areas will see temperature increases by one and a half to two degrees Celsius. We'll see an increase in extreme rainfall events over the KwaZulu-Natal, uh, northern parts of Eastern Cape, and also the eastern parts of the Free State and Lesotho. Again, if you remember what happened last year in the Durban, um, floods, a lot of rain in a very short period of time. We can expect that we'll see more, more of these events. More, they will happen more frequently, and when they do happen, it will be more severe. Uh, droughts, more droughts um, forecasted or actually expected in areas like the Western Cape and Limpopo, Northern Cape. Again, these are regions that we already know is battling with water um, security and also water scarcity. Um, so, so this is just to show yeah, the climate impacts. And then when we get to vulnerability, this is also an important picture. We are seeing um, an increase in vulnerability, as I mentioned, and infrastructure is becoming more vulnerable. Communities are becoming more vulnerable. And I think this was very, very slow poverty reduction within the region and in South Africa specifically as well. So this graph shows you the number of people in South Africa, again, under the $5.50 mark that's living in poverty, and then also the percentage of population. So in 2023, um, uh, we're speaking around like, roughly around 30 million people. This will grow to around just above 32 million people within the next two decades. And this is because of population growth again, uh, slow economic um, growth, and then you'll see a very, very tardy and slow reduction in poverty. And we're expecting within the next two decades that we'll still have above 46% um, of people living in poverty. So the vulnerability in the region will remain very, very high. Also, what is important to, to realize is that only around 16% of climate disasters, those that I've shown you um, in South Africa um, that was recorded, was covered by insurance. So which means that when a disaster does struck, it leaves a community unable to build back it leaves government unable to have the finances to build back. And again, this erodes our development gains. Okay, so this map, um, which is also taken from the Green Book, is a worst case scenario, but it shows us all of South Africa's 1,600 towns. And those marked in red and dark orange is the settlements that we can expect will see most significant impacts from climate disasters in the next three decades. So this is around 30% of South African settlements will see a rise in increases associated with droughts. Um, I'm just going to show that one quickly. Uh, it's this one. So all the settlements here in red and, and dark orange will see an increase in drought events within the next three decades. And around 60% of South African settlements will be at risk of increased exposure of wildfires. And 21% of our settlements we'll see an increase in urban flooding. So this is this, um, this picture here, and you can see places like Durban, Peter Maritzburg, the Gauteng area, uh, East London, several of these um, secondary cities marked in red here will all see an increase in um, flooding events. So if we take all of us together into one map and we say which areas we'll see a lot of population pressure, slow reduction in poverty, um, in poverty, so high vulnerability rates, and increased exposure to natural hazards. This map shows us the risk of loss of lives and loss of livelihoods within the next three decades emanating because of things like flooding, drought, wildfires, extreme temperatures. So showing us and pointing us to our metro cities, pointing us to our big, larger secondary cities, and showing us which of these settlements really will be in need of critical investment adaptation measures to safeguard the lives of those people. Okay, so this brings us to what, what can we do about this? So, so what are the solutions to this problem? So I think the first one is, is not doing anything about this really isn't an option. And this is why I circle back to this diagram because we need to intervene in all of these three areas if we wanna curb losses associated with natural disasters. So we need mitigation efforts. Um, I think there's a lot of talk about this, there's a lot of investment in this, and a lot of global efforts, because this is what we need. Um, energy policies uh, that focus on renewables, uh, sustainable practices that's um, adopted by society, that's adopted by businesses themselves um, at large. 
So this is the only way you're going to be able to achieve the mitigation targets and land use policies that reduce emissions. Um, but the focus really here on mitigation is to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. And we have seen investment in this, like I've mentioned, but not nearly enough um, to be able to say that it will make a dramatic impact on these climate disasters in the next two to three decades. So the second part where we can then intervene is in the adaptation space. We can reduce exposure and we can increase the resilience of communities. So we need to reduce exposure. Uh, things like early warning systems, they are very effective. We have them in South Africa, um, but there is definitely a miscommunication between those putting them out, the communities receiving them and then acting upon that. Um, flood protection mechanism, so critical um, flood control measures, uh, infrastructure is needed to safeguard many communities, especially communities that's already established and already built. Um, we do need to think about relocation methods where communities are not fully settled and where they are in high risk areas, specifically communities in flood zones. Um, um, they, they need to be looked at. Uh, local disaster contingency plans, we've put out a couple of calls for municipalities to get their heat contingency plans up to standard, because this is something that can really cause a lot of loss of life. If we think back to 2003 in France, a lot of people lost their lives, and this is something that we are also forecasting for South Africa if local municipalities do not take um, heat contingency plans into account. Uh, relocation protection, I've mentioned, I may, mentioned that, and then also the mainstreaming of adaptation actions into the design of our cities. Things like restoring our ecological infrastructure, building permutable surfaces, ensuring water is captured within cities. Um, there's wonderful initiatives like, um, I know, um, span city initiatives by large engineering infrastructure companies. And then the third point is we need to build resilience within communities. And this is really critically important to reduce their vulnerabilities. So this is anything from poverty reduction, which is easier said than done, but awareness campaigns already helps a lot. Just making communities that are at high risk aware that they are at high risk offering more safer spaces for them to live in. Um, good communication channels, I mentioned those, uh, to be able to effectively enable timely responses. Um, development needs should really be guided, even if it's like informality. Um, informality we know will increase because of the slow economic performance, but also because of the population growth, urbanization. So if we know that, just guide the informality on safe spaces, uh, removing them out of the rivers, removing them out of high risk areas so that we can reduce that risk of loss of life and loss of uh, livelihoods. Um, also things like um, protecting our critical infrastructure that is very, very important. And then also getting more climate finance within the adaptation space. So there's very little climate finance going towards adaptation. And I think that is also something that globally is being put on the table and that is really something that a lot of people are pushing for, that there's more funding going to adaptation. Yeah, and then um, insurance products also making that sure that people have access to that so that when a disaster does strike, they are able to build back. Um, and that's also quite important. And then other methods of reducing exposure is just good land use management, good city planning basic things that will ensure that people are actually protected from these natural disasters. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to stop there. My, my time is up and then I'm going to hand over back to you, Johandi, but just to mention that if anybody is interested in any of the longer term trends that I've mentioned on poverty or inequality or a specific country of interest, you're very welcome to reach out to us and then uh, we can, we can take you through that. Thank you, Elise. And there was a couple of questions that came through. Um, and in the earlier stages of your presentation, there was one that came through asking, are the hydrometeorological disasters reoccurring or is the graph depicting climate change? Okay, now I think that's a very, very important question. So, so I think that's why I wanted to show that graph of the flooding events as well. So climate is definitely, definitely impacting on the fact that we are seeing an increase in natural hazards. 
So we're seeing an increase in things like extreme weather, um, extreme temperature increases, rainfall events that's more intense. That's undoubtedly the case, but also the humans in terms of where they are locating, we are seeing an increase in exposure. So people are locating directly on unsafe spaces because our cities are not keeping pace with accommodating people in a safe and sustainable manner. We're also seeing an increase in exposure. So both of that, the increase in exposure and the increase in natural hazards is causing this uptick in losses. And that's why we're also forecasting that irrespective from climate change, we will see an uptick in loss of life and loss of livelihoods within the region. Thank you. Um, I see there's many questions coming through whether uh, the attendees will be receiving the presentation. Yes, you will. We'll be sharing it with you after the session. Um, then the second question, what is the trend of insurance cover and conditions linked to natural disasters and climate change? I know you've touched on this, but maybe if you can add anything to that. Yeah, I think that's also a very good question. I wish somebody from either Santam or Momentum's on the line, but um, I know that the penetration within the informality space is very low. They've been trying to fix that to say, how do we get insurance products to uh, informal settlements, people living in these spaces? And I know there's been some progress on that. Um, I, I'm not sure how the trend looks like in terms of penetration, but what we do know is that a very low percentage of people and assets are currently insured against natural hazards, which is concerning because even government assets, not all of that is, that is insured. So if something happens and there is um, critical road infrastructure um, being washed away or critical any type of critical infrastructure, or if it's housing or if it's your own personal infrastructure, if that gets damaged and you're not insured, you've got nothing to be able to build back with aside from external assistance. But this is really concerning because if the government loses a lot of money, like in the Nisner fires or in the Durban flooding events, if you don't get external assistance, this erodes your development budget. So then you are taking it from other places to try and build back. So you're not moving forward. You're just trying to catch up where you were. So we are seeing this erosion in development. But this the train part, I, I won't be able to answer that. That's a question for one of our insurance partners. Thank you. Um, Nanda also asked, what is the risk exposure for South Africa related to water, energy, and food security? Oh, I think that's a, that's a very, very good question. Um, I can quickly show, let me just, I just want to open up our, I won't be able to answer all of them, but I just want to show the power of the African Futures and Innovation website. If you go to a specific um, country, in this case, she asked about South Africa. If you click on the South Africa Geographical Report, it has a lot of a long-term forecast. So she asked about food security. I'll take that as an example. If you go within a specific geographic report, we can go to something like, um, argument's sake, agriculture. Um, and we can, we can look at the agricultural imports. We can look... Um, at, at agricultural production in the region. And then we can look at the mismatch between demand for agricultural produce and also the um, supply of these agricultural produce. So in the static space, I think we are seeing this a growth of, of an, actually a divergence between production and demand. So demand outpacing production. In the South Africa space specifically, we're not there, there yet. We are a, a net exporter and food security is not at a critical level. But in the Southern Africa region, it is becoming more critical. And then in the African region, it is really quite dire. So again, just to show you, for instance, um, there's an agriculture theme on the website that covers a lot of these aspects. Um, and you can look at things like yields per capita. That's very low in Africa compared to the rest of the world. And you can also look at the calorie needs and then um, agricultural production demand is then just something I quickly want to show this growing, growing, growing gap. So this is production in blue for the African continent in terms of metric tons from 1970 to forecast to 2045. You can see production is picking up. We are getting better at producing food, but you can see the demand, and this is driven largely by population growth, is outpacing. Um, production. So this growing, growing, growing gap, and that gap is food insecurity. So it means we need to import food, 
and then you are subjected to fluctuations in prices and whatever is going on in the global space, be it constraints in logistics or, or import constraints, and that can translate um, to, to quite worrying pictures. Um, South Africa specifically, like I mentioned, not there yet. SADC, warning signs, but Africa clearly, clearly, clearly a problematic area. Thank you for that. Um, the links have also been shared in the chat if you want a reference to that, anybody? And then Crystal Maria also asked, do you have a sense of how much risk can be managed proactively so that the limited insurance resources can be optimally applied? Hi, Crystal. Nice to see you again as well. Um, not in terms of, of figures, but I do know there are a couple of really, really great initiatives currently specifically emanating out of the private sector that's trying to reduce the risk within South Africa and the municipalities. Um, so many years ago, after the Neisner fires, a lot of insurance companies stood up and said that they need to manage this better um, because poor management within the municipalities are costing them dearly and it's becoming people are becoming uninsurable, municipality assets are becoming uninsurable. So they decided to create um, things like the P4RR and, and now the new Climate Disaster Resilience Fund is something that was developed out of Suntam and insurance um, companies to say that what can they do in the municipal space to start building resilience and to start reducing risk. Nice initiative. So they are supporting things like the Green Book, um, educating municipal officers on what are the risks, how do you adapt to the risk, what do you need to do in terms to reduce that risk, so practical training. They're also supporting communities in terms of building resilience, uh, awareness raising campaigns, um, building communities' capacities to withstand some of those risks, and then again, the bigger one that I think is actually helping municipalities to be able to identify their risk and to start mitigating that risk. And, and that's, a, that's a private sector initiative, which I think more and more of that will come on the, on the scene, and those are brilliant initiatives. Thank you. Walter's asking, in what ways could tax and lending strategies by banks help build res resilience? And then a second part of that question, which aspects of climate change risk should be prioritized? Okay, so maybe maybe you're maybe on the tax issue. I think in South Africa, there's not a lot more you can get out of people. Um, lending strategies is definitely a way of, of of investing, but I think you would have to obviously safeguard those investments. And currently, if you don't have like a risk, risk mitigation strategy, it would be very difficult to um, convince investors that that some of this is worth it. But but I think definitely lending strategies um, definitely is an option. I don't think tax strategies is an option. And what was the second question, Johan, uh, Johan did? Give me a six, I want to go back there. Which aspects of climate change risk should be prioritized? Okay, I think for, for South Africa, it is reducing exposure and building resilience. I mean, we, we do need to focus on mitigation efforts, but these are global things. And, and we can do very little about China, or the US or Europe or the rest of Africa. But what we in South Africa can do something about is our exposure and our vulnerability. So exposure. I think one of the biggest things is just to get people out of harm's way immediately. Mm -hmm. So 35,000 buildings in Tuane known to be in the indicative flood line, 23,500 buildings in Durban known to be highly, highly, highly vulnerable in terms of or highly at risk for flooding. 70,000 people being at risk to flooding in Durban. Address those because they will be your next disaster. If I just think about Tswane, there's a community in Mamalodi, Eerste Fabrika, within the indicative flood line, directly located within it. So you either need to build infrastructure to protect them and ensure they're not going to be flooded in December, or you need to relocate them. That's your only two options. Um, you can make the community aware that they are located in a flood line, but if you don't offer them alternative accommodation, the places to live, you'll just see repeated flooding every December. We'll see repeated flooding when there's cutter flow systems crossing over Durban because there are so much exposure to it. So that's my, my, my thinking is exposure, reducing that, building resilience. Two biggest things we can do in South Africa. Mm, that makes sense. 
Uh, Christelle also asked uh, regarding the Green Book, is the Green Book a more granular, granular tool, uh, extension of the information available for the South Africa on the African Futures website? No. So, so these, this is two different initiatives. So, so, so I was wearing two hats, one being a researcher when I still worked at the Green Book and then my new role in more long-term forecasts. But the Green Book has gone and subsequently, Christel, since you last saw it, it was always on a municipal level, providing information to municipalities on their risks, vulnerabilities, exposure, natural hazards. That team has gone on to create what they call the Metro View, which is a brilliant tool. So they've done it for Twane, they've done it for Buffalo City, they've done it for Itaqueni, where they zoom in and make it extremely granular to say on a like a sub place and even lower than a sub place level, what are the exposure? And that's where I got the figures from, the 23,000 people, there's like 560 kilometers of roads exposed in Etiquini. Um, and you can go and look at that. So in the green book, the Metro View, that's a new product that they've launched in the last couple of months. And then the African Futures and Innovation Portal that I've shown the longer term trends and patterns. This is a standalone portal. And this is really to show development trends and patterns for Africa. All of Africa's 54 member states is covered in this and various aspects from demographics, economics, agriculture, water, governance, security is then captured in these longer term trends per country um, for the entire Africa. Thank you. And then Nanda's asking, to what extent is our current education system, including these risks in the curriculum to ensure proper mitigation and adaptation measures are considered? Like to what extent are engineers and town planners designing and planning for these risks? Mm, yeah. So, so not enough is the short answer to that. There are brilliant initiatives again. Um, there are schooling systems that educate children around the risk of flooding, don't cross a flooding river. And there are initiatives that goes into communities, grassroots level organizations that educate them about their risk. Um, there are universities that's embedding climate change adaptation within infrastructure design and building. But it's not it's not everywhere. So this notion of of so when engineers, for instance, build a road or a bridge, they do take weather, rainfall patterns, historical rainfall patterns, flood parameters. That's part of their design. So so they they are trained how to do that. But it's very seldom that you see that they would take forecasts for the next three or four or five decades into account and then plan according to that. So they plan with what we know, what, what, what did happen. So the last four or five decades of flooding records, it's difficult to say, please plan for the next four decades of flooding records because it becomes very complex and these systems are changing faster than we can actually um, make informed decisions about. There's been initiatives, I know the UK aid funded a large DFID project where they specifically in the road sector targeted infrastructure engineers to say, take the climate change projections and try and embed them in your design parameters to make roads climate resilient for the next two, three decades. But it's very difficult, a lot of uncertainties, um, but, but they are thinking and there is a shift towards us. And we are seeing it in the engineering world, we are seeing it in the town planning world. But again, few municipalities, few universities, it's not being done nearly enough and quickly enough. One more question on the food security. Do you think South African food security is a threat due to climate disasters and government's inability to provide funding for adaptation? Andrea's question. Yeah, so I think it's a it's a difficult question, but I think there's definitely a risk. I think um, if we look at things like um, drought, uh, what, what drought events, if we just look logically at this, what, what drought events have done historically um, in South Africa, they have caused crop failures, um, they have caused a reduction in yields per, per hectare, and we know drought events will increase. We know the water security situation is not being addressed rigorously enough. So if you just take those two patterns that we know that's unfolding, there's definitely an enormous risk for reduction in yields and reduction in production in the agricultural sector, which brings us back to the farmers. I think they are becoming more resilient. We are seeing very innovative um, approaches on of farmers using very smart technologies to be able to adapt. But again, that falls to the farmer itself. So the farmers that's able to adapt 
and it's able to become smarter and utilize additional infrastructure, they'll be able to become more resilient. But on a large scale, you know, farmers that require additional assistance, I think they will become more and more and more vulnerable and we'll definitely see, I think, food insecurity going into the next two, three decades. Um, then I've got Sophia asking, who is accountable? This is also on a previous answer you've given. Who is accountable for the location of dwellings within flood zones? If, if I could answer that, there would be less legal battles between the insurance companies and the municipalities. Um, many times people were, so now I'm talking about formal dwellings, um, where formal dwelling is within a flood line, you would assume that the municipality is liable because they are responsible for land use management, land use management planning. It's within their mandate. If they allow you to build somewhere, I mean, that should be a, a safe space. It shouldn't be in an indicative flood line. It shouldn't be in a storm surge area in the coast. Yet some places in Durban, people are within the storm surge line. And this is a battle between the insurance companies and municipalities who's responsible for that. Informality, it's also a loaded question. If a community is made aware that they are in an unsafe area, is it the government's responsibility um, to locate them immediately? Um, is there dual responsibility in the community not to be able to locate and settle there? So it is a very complex question. It would depend if you talk about informality, formality, what the historical reason was for people to settle there. It might be that you had a formal area that was legally um, let's say erected, and then because of the way in which the city developed and grew, maybe the additional flood runoff is now causing flooding in that area. And then you would have to build flood mitigation measures. You would have to build additional infrastructure. Investment would need to be um, invested to be able to channel the rivers or to um, make the water drain into the area or to create sponge, sponge cities or, and so forth. But, that, but it's a complex question. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, then another follow-up question on the Green Book from Gordon. Given the Green Book and its approach um, has been in the public domain for some time, do you at least have any sense of the recognition by provinces and districts and local municipalities, even metros, incorporating the approach into their planning? Yeah, again, it varies, but it varies depending on the capacity within the municipality. Etiquini, they invested together with APSA and other donors into that metro view for Etiquini. So it means they really, really, really went all in. They are using it as part of their planning processes. Same in Twane, it informed their indicative risk profiling and their climate response strategy was built on top of that. And I think Buffalo City was saying because they've got a metro view. Um, places like um, the municipality where George Neisner, uh, sorry, the, the name escapes me now, but that municipality is also extremely forward thinking um, where the Eisner fires were, and they've learned a lot of hard lessons. So they are embracing risk profiling within the Green Book and municipal training. And also within the Green Book, they've now focused and shifted to an approach where they are training the municipalities. So they're trying to get the training online so that more municipalities can have access to that and that it's online and freely available, freely accessible. But again, you need proficient municipal officials and capacity to be able to absorb that and to implement that. So some of the municipalities are doing it, yes. Many are not, no. Not because of not the information being available, but because of the capacity lacking. We are moving towards the end of our session. So I'm gonna um, ask the last question. Um, is the trade-off always between risk versus resilience in this context, or is it sustainability, or is sustainability the greatest organizational cap capability to optimize from a forecast perspective? This is from Gokwana. Good question. Um, Joanna, I think, I think risk is what you want to avoid. <laughs> Building resilience is one option, and doing it through sustainable mechanisms is, is definitely the way to go. And this is within many of the sectors, very important. Sustainable practices are um, really critical if we are to protect the environment, which again would help with natural hazard side of things, but also in terms of the vulnerability side of people. Um, so sustainable practices is definitely important.
I've shared um, Elisa's information with you just now because I know there's still many questions. Um, you are more than welcome to make contact with Elise directly through her LinkedIn or email, or you can and you can also scan the QR code to give us feedback on the session. Elise, thank you so much. We can see that there was uh, so much engagement, and people are obviously this is a very trending um, topic. And thank you so much for showing us and giving us insight into being resilient and handling these risks with resilience. Thank you so much. Thank you. And again, thank you for hosting us. And just Gordon made a comment about adopting a municipality. I think that is an awesome approach for the private sector. And we need more private sector to jump on board and to help with this challenge. Thank you, everybody. You may have a wonderful Wednesday.